Welcome to the Rheumatology Highlights Report. My name is Hans Belsma from the Netherlands and I would like to discuss with you the advances in metabolic bone disease as reported at the Euroconference in London in May this year. I have selected a few items to discuss. I first would like to tell a little bit about the structure of the EULAR and the items about osteoporosis. Then I have selected abstracts that were brought forward to the EULAR Congress, and I've um, pulled them around three themes, risk factors, drugs used for osteoporosis, and other treatment modalities. First, a little bit about EULAR. Over 16,000 participants gathered together in London. There were five osteoporosis sessions, and they draw an attention of about 400, but most of them about 1,000 participants. There were two clinical sessions, one called osteoporosis in the long run, and this especially dealt with problems as when to stop bisphosphonate treatment, how do we improve compliance of patients, and so on. The second clinical session was about can and should we prevent fractures, dealing with the new measurements of the FRAX, dealing with risk factors and how to deal with that, especially also in the context of rheumatic diseases. So these two sessions were invited speakers, and they gave a good state of the art on these items. The most interesting were the new data which were brought to the Congress by submitting abstracts, and over 120 abstracts on osteoporosis were selected for the Congress. About 10 of them were in oral presentations. About 10 of them were in guided poster tours. And the other ones were displayed at the Congress. In an addition, there were three satellite symposia dealing with osteoporotic items at the Congress. Uh, I selected most of the abstracts based on which were selected for oral presentations and guided poster tours, and that was due to the fact that I was a member of the committee selecting these, and these were, in my opinion, indeed the most interesting new data. The first deals with risk factors. Here you see glucocorticoids, and this was a presentation from the UK, from primary care, and they looked at a large cohort of patients with polymyalgia aromatica, all of them needing a long-term glucocorticoid treatment and over 80% of these at the age of 65 or over. According to the UK guidelines, all of these patients should have been offered osteoporosis prophylactis, but unfortunately, unfortunately only 60% of them indeed got prophylaxis. Reassuring for rheumatologists was the fact that rheumatologists were much more prudent in this way than GPs. Another item on glucocorticoids was a study from Japan. In this study, they looked at patients with rheumatoid arthritis being treated with tocilizumab, and they showed that tocilizumab administration significantly inhibited inflammation, disease activity, and physical disability. But they especially looked at the possibility to reduce glucocorticoids during this treatment, and they showed that at the same time they were able to reduce glucocorticoids, they restored parameters of bone and mineral metabolism in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Another risk factor is body weight. This is a study from uh, the UK in which they looked at a very large uh, setting where many people came for bone mineral density measurements and they looked at the association between BMI and BMD and they found that the BMI is more associated with hip BMD than lumbar BMD. As expected, they found that obese patients referred for DEXA scanning had a much lower prevalence of osteoporosis than the other part of the population. And they did some calculations on their large cohort, and they found that when people had a BMI above 30 and had an age below 70 years, DEXA scanning was not helpful at all. You would not discover any low bone mineral density, and the suggestion would be not to make DEXA scans in people of this age with this high BMI. 
Another risk factor for osteoporosis is, of course, alcohol. Again, a study from the UK. They had a large group of people who used excessive alcohol, and they showed that that had a significant effect on the bone mineral density of the lumbar spine, while the bone mineral density of the neck of the femur was unaffected. However, they found in this population quite a large number of hip fractures, so these are not related to the low hip BMD, but I think we can all figure out what is the cause of these increased number of fractures. The next item was patients with rheumatoid arthritis. A group from Japan in the tomorrow study evaluated bone mineral density in the arms, the lower limbs, the vertebrae, and they showed a significantly low BMD in the RA group compared to controls, as expected. In addition, they measured lean body mass, which was lower, and fat mass, which was higher in RA patients than in controls. I was wondering how many of these people were using glucocorticoids, but these data were not easily available at the poster, so that could be a reason why this is the case, but it could also have other reasons about immobility in these patients. In addition, they showed that bone mineral density and lean body mass correlated positively and showed a negative correlation with fat mass. The next group of posters I would like to discuss are related to drugs used for osteoporosis. We all are well aware of the drug denosumab. This has been around now for a few years and it was interesting to see what kind of new data were available. First, a study which was dealing with the question that worries a lot of people. If you're treating patients for their osteoporosis with drugs affecting bone metabolism, do you not uh, make the bone completely inert? This has been discussed in bisphosphonates, and these authors looked at the, uh, the effect of denosumab. So they had a group of patients that had been treated with denosumab, but had discontinued this treatment for a mean of two years. They performed biopsies, and the biopsies of these patients showed normal histology without any evidence of pathology. In addition, they performed histomorphometric parameters of bone remodeling, such as tetracycline labeling, and they found that these parameters were well within the range of non-treated postmenopausal women. So this suggests that two years after treating patients with zinozumab, at least there's no negative effect regarding inertia of the bone present. An update was given on the so-called Freedom Trial. The Freedom Trial was a study in which patients with uh, osteoporosis were treated with denosumab or placebo. And as you might remember, and you can see it on the left part of the slide, patients that had an, uh, were 70 years or older had a quite a large number of fractures in the three years, and then when they were treated with denosumab, it was in the same order as patients with a lower age. So what they did, they followed these patients after those three years. After these three years, all patients were being treated with denosumab, and when the patients had five years continuous denosumab, they showed that the total BMD increase reached 14% in the spine, and 7% in the hip. If patients were first treated with placebo and the last two years with denosumab, in those two years, the BMD increased 8% in the spine and 4% uh, in the total hip. And also interesting was that in those last two years, the number of fractures in both groups was very low and not significantly different from each other. Well, when you have a very effective drug like denosumab, it's quite clear that other people are looking at other possibilities to use the same mechanism. So this is a study from the Netherlands looking at a new anti rank ligand nanobody, which was used in healthy postmenopausal women. They reported their data on the phase one trial, showed that that was used safely over a wide range of dosages, and even at the lowest dosage, this new rank ligand inhibitor exhibited a, a strong and sustained inhibitory effect on bone resorption markers. 
So undoubtedly we will hear more about this new drug. Also interesting was, is there any news about the fractures in the, um, the femur fractures in patients who are being treated for a long time with bisphosphonates? This is data from a Spanish meta-analysis. They found, in fact, two uh, studies. One was a post hoc analysis looking at the incidence of fractures of the femur in three large clinical trials with bisphosphonates, and they found a very low incidence of the atypical fractures and no apparent association with the use of bisphosphonates. And when they looked at the combined rate of uh, subtrochanteric diaphysial femur fractures, they found a rate of only 2.3 per 10,000 patient years. The second study dealt with a large register-based matched cohort study, and they found that the ratio between the classical hip fracture and subtrochanteric diaphysial femur fracture was identical in the group of patients treated with alendronate and they matched untreated fracture controls. So this seems to be rather reassuring. Was there further news on bisphosphonates? I came across an interesting study which I do not completely understand. This is a study in which they looked at patients, at female patients who had been using alendronate and another group risedronate. And they were looking in the urine of these women to find whether there were uh, signs of the bisphosphonates or products uh, after stopping the treatment. So they had women who had been using uh, alendronate up to 19 months beforehand, and then they found still in a large number of these women uh, products of alendronate in the urine. When they did the same in patients being treated with risedronate, they could not find any sign of risedronate in the urine after some period after cessation. So if this is indeed true, and I think it needs to be confirmed, this may have implications when we have to treat young patients, for instance, in SLE female patients with high dosages of glucocorticoids because of her nephritis. In that case, we would tend to choose risedronate and not alendronate. But I still need to find confirmation because I do not understand the mechanism very well. In addition, the authors in this uh, study also showed a relationship between alendronate levels and bone resorption as well as time of treatment cessation, and this further indicates a residual effect of alendronate in bone despite discontinuation of the treatment. Good news in the field of osteoporosis treatment is a study from the United States. They looked at patients that were admitted because of a hip fracture, and they showed that there has been a clear decline among all racial and gender groups in the United States. You see data from 1998 with a prevalence of these fractures of over 1,000 per 100,000. When they looked at the same uh, data in 2008, there was a decrease of more than 40% in white females, in black females, in Hispanic females, slightly less in white males, and the same in black and Hispanic males. So it looks to be that all the attention for osteoporosis and all the preventive treatment really has an effect, and this is a significant decrease in which uh, people can be proud to have reached this. The last item are for some other treatment modalities. Vertebroplasty has been an item for the last years. This is a study from Spain looking at patients that were uh, from a randomized control trial that were treated with vertebroplasty or conservative. And they found a significant improvement in quality of life in both groups at each follow-up assessment up till one year. When they compared the conventional therapy, the improvement in fast pain was greater in patients treated with vertebroplasty at two and at 12 months, as to be expected. However, and we know that from other studies as well, that during follow-up, patients treated with vertebroplasty presented a higher incidence of new vertebral fractures than those with conservative approach. And the data were very impressive. 20% new 
structures in the vertebroplasty group versus only 5% in the conservative treated group. So this indicates that indeed there's only a limited place for this kind of treatment in patients with osteoporosis. Interesting new data came from Germany. They developed a, what they call Stabilite Vertebral Augmentation System. This provides a navigational osteotome to create a site and site-specific cavity prior to delivering ultra-high viscosity cement with an extended working time. And they make this cement by applying radio frequency energy immediately prior to entering the patient. With this new method, they treat it in a completely open way, 113 uh, patients with different osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures. The mean pain visual analog scale improved significantly from pre to post treatment on a scale of 0 to 100 from 84 to 25 and there was further improvement still after 12 months. Because they knew the new technique to make what they call a cavity, they of course looked at cement leakage on plain radiographs, but they noted that only in nine patients of the 114. In addition, they reported no procedure-related serious adverse events in these treated patients. So these are some of the highlights which were uh, discussed at the Eula Congress in London, and I thank you very much for your attention.